All right, get out your pencils and let's look at what I've learned about God-inspired imagination. This really could make a major difference in your life if you'll let God expand the way you think about your family, your career, your life, God, and everything else. Number one, the first thing, my imagination shapes my life. My imagination shapes my life. In other words, the way you think is gonna affect the way you feel, and the way you feel is gonna affect the way you act, and if you wanna change the way you act, you need to change the way you think. Proverbs 23, verse seven, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It is, it is God's way of saying, I want you to understand that how, how I work in your life is through your thoughts. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. For instance, the person who says, I can't do this, and the person who says, I can't do this, are both right. They're both right. Because if you think you can't, you can't, and if you think you can, you, you can. The person who says, I just can't imagine that ever happening to me, well guess what, it won't. It won't, because you're already doing a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, the Bible says this in Proverbs 4, 23. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by what? Your thoughts, circle that, your, your thoughts. Now, because I've always been interested in this, in the power of imagination, particularly as it relates to faith, I've collected quotes of famous people over the years about imagination, and I thought I would just share some of them with you. Here's the first one from Albert Einstein. Look up here on the screen. Einstein says, imagination is more important than knowledge. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. See, there's no limit to your imagination. The true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination, Albert Einstein. That's interesting, very interesting. Okay, here's one, George Bernard Shaw, the famous playwright and poet. Imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine, and then you create what you will. In other words, Michelangelo, when he painted the Sistine Chapel, those beautiful frescoes, he had to imagine it all in his mind. He had to see it in his mind before he could put it on, on the wall. C.S. Lewis, the greatest Christian thinker of the last century, said imagination is the organ of meaning. Napoleon Bonaparte, imagination rules the world. The philosopher Pascal said, imagination decides everything. William Arthur Ward said, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it, and if you can dream it, you can become it. And then that great theologian, George Lucas. <laughs> you can't do it unless you imagine it. Imagine him imagining all of the Star Wars trilogies. That took quite a lot of imagination. Okay, that's George Lucas, okay? Uh, and then here are a couple other uh, great leaders. Uh, Walt Disney said, Disneyland will never be completed. It will continue to grow as long as um, there's imagination left in the world. And then this quote, Saddleback will never stop growing. <laughs> as long as there's one person who's not heard the good news of Jesus, we will keep reaching out. That's from the first sermon in 1980. <laughs> imagination. Imagination. Now, God warned about the power of imagination being misused. And he tells the people in, in Babel where they were building this giant tower of Babel, which was gonna be uh, basically an idol. Uh, uh, they were gonna build it to reach up to God. And here's what God says in Genesis 11 about imagination. The Lord said, now that they are one people speaking one language, this is only the beginning of what they will do. Now, nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Notice, this is God talking. God always speaks the truth. He says, because they're one people with one language, and they're unified, they've got clear communication, he said, nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Now this is actually a warning. But there's also a teaching here. If you are a businessman, I want you to listen closely. How do you get a group of people to do the impossible? How do you make the impossible possible? Maybe you've got a project in your business that you go, man, there's no way this is gonna happen. How do you get people to do the impossible? Well, he says there are three things. 
You need cooperation, you need communication, and you need imagination. He said you gotta have cooperation, they've gotta be unified, one people. You gotta have clear communication, they're speaking one language, and you've gotta have imagination. And if you've got those three, that's how the impossible becomes possible. That's a little leadership tip I just thought I'd throw in there. Now number two, second thing I've learned about imagination. Imagining is, a simp is essential to living by faith. Imagination is essential to living by faith. In fact, you cannot live by faith without using your imagination. Because since you can't see God, you gotta use imagination to practice your faith. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is the great chapter of heroes of the faith. And by the way, if you're, you've been honored as a hero of faith, we do want you to pick up one of these pens on the way going out, the hero of faith. But in Hebrews 11, we have God's Hall of Fame. You know, there's a rock, rock and roll Hall of Fame, there's a baseball Hall of Fame. Well, God has a Hall of Fame, and it's called Hebrews chapter 11. And in the Bible, he lists all the people who are the real heroes in God's book. Abraham, Moses, and Joseph, and Gideon, and all these people. And he starts off Hebrews 11 talking about faith by saying this in verse one, defining faith. Let's read it aloud together. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. Now notice two things. Faith is a way of seeing. And he says here that, that God says whatever we hope for, when you, when you believe it's gonna happen, not that it might happen, that's hope. When you believe it will happen, that's faith. And he said it's the evidence of things we cannot yet see. God gave you two ways of seeing, gave every human being two ways of seeing. First, you can see through your physical eyes, that's one way of seeing, and second, you can see by the imagination in your mind, and you can picture things in your mind, and you can, you, of course you dream them, but you can visualize them, and that's another way of seeing. And when you can't see something physically, you have to imagine it in your mind. Now it says here that faith is when we hope for something and we know it's going to happen. In order to hope for something, you have to picture it in your mind. Do you remember when you were a kid, and at Christmas time, there were gifts wrapped under the, uh, the Christmas tree? And you started, you saw the ones with your name on it, and you started imagining what was inside that box. And you got excited because you thought you knew what was inside that box because you were picturing it in your mind. You could not see it, but you were imagining that gift. You were imagining that toy. And this is a tool that God says you have to use in walking on with Christ because you can't see God. So when you can't see God right now, you have to imagine. God has given us tools of imagination. Communion, the Lord's Supper, baptism. Those, both of those symbols engage your imagination. They help us visualize, they help us picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ going under the water, coming back out, is a picture of Jesus dying and being buried and rising again. And communion is a picture of Jesus giving his body and blood for your salvation. They are tools that engage your imagination. Now, when you read the rest of Hebrews 11 about all those heroes of faith, you realize that every one of them became heroes of faith because they used their imagination. For instance, God says to Abraham, Abraham, uh, you're 90 years old and you have no kids, but I'm gonna change your name to Abram, from Abram to Abraham, which means father of a great nation. Now, for about a, a, a decade, Abraham still has no kids. And so he goes to a local restaurant, he said party for two, you know, table for two. What's your name? Uh, father of a great nation. Oh wow, that's neat, how many kids you got? None. <laughs> It'd be pretty embarrassing to be named father of a great nation and you don't have any kids. But God always calls things that are not as though they were. He names it in advance. And then he says, I want you to go outside, Abraham, and he said, I want you to count the stars at night. And he said, that's how many grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grand. How many are you gonna have in your family tree? That's gonna be the nation of Israel. That's gonna be how many Jews there are in the world. Count all the stars. What is God doing when he tells Abraham to go count the stars? He is activating his imagination. He's saying, I want you to visualize what I'm gonna do in your life. Look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 4.18. We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. 
What we see will last only a short time, but what we cannot see will last forever. Now what does that verse mean? It means that the material is temporary and the immaterial is eternal. For instance, everybody can see this chair right now. It's a wooden chair, it's material, but it's not gonna last. It won't last 500 years. This chair will decay and fall apart. It's not gonna last. It's material, and anything material isn't gonna last. On the other hand, you can't see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they're gonna last for eternity. You can't see your own soul. It's gonna last for eternity. And the Bible says you need to focus on the things that are gonna last which you actually can't see with your eyes. You have to imagine them only by imagination. So, my imagination shapes my life, and imagination is essential to living by faith. Number three, third thing I've learned, great lives are built on great dreams. Great lives are built around great dreams. In my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of very great people. Some of them are famous, some of them are not famous, because fame and greatness have nothing to do with each other. You can be famous and not be great, and you can be great and not be famous. But in great lives, they're built around great dreams. What I've discovered is that nobody is naturally a great person. You don't just uh, you know, pop out of your mommy being a great person. No, you become great by attaching your life to a great cause, a great purpose, or a great dream. You need something bigger than yourself to draw you out of yourself, to make you grow better than yourself, and that's what makes you a great person. Until you have a great dream, you will never be a great woman. Until you have a great dream for your life, you will never be a great man. If you don't have a great vision, if you don't have a great dream, it is impossible for you to be great. Greatness comes from what you attach yourself to. You need something bigger than yourself that pulls you out of your self-centeredness that makes you great. Now during Daring Faith, I want to help you unlock your imagination. And I want to help you become a more great person. And I want you to, to, to dream and to visualize and to think about how God wants to use your career, how God wants to use your future, your finances, your family, your giving, your ministry your career. And my prayer for you is actually this next verse on your outline, Ephesians chapter one. As your pastor, I'm praying this. May God enlighten the eyes of your mind so that you can see the hope that his calling holds for you. Now notice this. May God enlighten the eyes of your mind. What's he talking about there? The eyes of your mind. He's not talking about your physical eyes. He's talking about your imagination. He's saying, I pray that your imagination will come alive and in faith you will be able to see God's dream for your life, God's vision for your life, God's purpose and plan for your life, God's calling on your life. God has a calling for you. Most people miss their calling in life. Why? Because they're following their dream instead of God's dream. I'm not interested in you following your dream. I'm interested in you in following God's dream. I could make up a dream for my life. I could say, you know, I dream of being a rock star and it would be a waste of my life because God didn't wire me to be a rock star. You could say, I dream of being da 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 And last week I asked you that in, in the questions. It was pretty funny, some of the things that came in. God said, I want you to give you, I want to give you my dream for your life and that's your calling. And he says, when you understand what I've made you for, what I've, what I've built you for, what, what I have a vision for your life, then you're gonna have hope. You will know the hope that his calling holds for you. If you want significance in your life, if you want satisfaction in your life, if you want fulfillment in your life, here's what you gotta do. You gotta stop following your dream for your life, and you gotta start following God's dream for your life. Because God's dream, when you fulfill it, you go, this is it, this is what I was made to be. It fits, I, I know my niche, I know why I'm alive. Now, if you can't imagine your calling, if you can't dream God's dream, you're not really living. You're just existing. And you're just going through life and without a dream, you're dying. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 18, where there is no vision, what does it say? The people perish, circle that, the people perish. I tell pastors, when a church has no dream, where there's no vision in the church, the people go to another parish. Now, as I said, I want you to discover God's dream. And one of the things that I 
told you that during Daring Faith, I'm gonna push you. I'm gonna stretch you, I'm gonna challenge you to discover God's dream for your life. And that leads me to number four, the fourth thing I've learned, and it's this. God's dream for my life is bigger than my dream. God's dream for my life is bigger than my dream. It's exponentially bigger, it's far larger, it's eternally significant. You know, there are a lot of dreams, you could have big dreams and they wouldn't be significant. You could dream of being a millionaire by a certain age or dream of being a billionaire. For what purpose? Just, do you think God put you on this planet to live for yourself? Of course not, of course not. God's dream is, for your life is bigger than your dream. Let me show you what the Bible says, Ephesians 3. God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dream. Notice, far more than you could ever imagine. God can do that in your life. Or guess, or request, in your wildest dream. Now, let me stop there. I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big dreamer. I've never been accused of small dreaming. I've never been accused of being a tiny thinker. I have big visions in life, and yet God says, Rick, think of the greatest thing I could do in your life. Think of the greatest way I could bless your life. Dream the biggest dream, the greatest vision, and I can top that. You have no idea what God wants to do in your life. You are living such a small fraction of what you're capable of. You are doing with your life such a small portion of what God wants to do in your life. God's dream for your life is enormous. It's big. He says, I can do more than you can imagine or guess or request in your wildest dream. The Bible says he does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. And by the way, the next verse after that says, so glory to God in the church, glory to God in Jesus, glory to God in all generations, and glory to God forever and ever. We just sang that. That's this verse. We just sang this, glory to God forever. Now I want you to write this down in your outline. God wants me to dream big. Write that down. God wants me to dream big. He wants me to use the imagination that he gave me. Because dreaming big honors God. It shows faith, it shows trust. Now you should base your dream not on what you think you could do, but you should base your dream on what you think God could do. I remember many years ago when we bought the Lake Forest property and the, the word got out in Orange County that a church was gonna go buy 120 acres. Let's put this in perspective. That's bigger than Disneyland. This property is bigger than Disneyland. And people said, what kind of church is this? Gonna go buy 120 acres of Orange County property. Who do those people think they are? And when I heard that, I said, that's the wrong question. The question is not, who do we think we are? It's who do we think God is? That's the real issue. Now write this down. Let the size of my God determine the size of my goal. I must let the size of my God, not the size of my gifts, but the size of my God determine the size of my goal. God's dream for my life is bigger than my dream. Number five, the fifth thing I've learned about dreaming and vision and imagination is this. Doubt is the enemy of imagination. Doubt is the enemy of imagination. Now, doubt and fear neutralize what God wants to do in your life. You see, it takes courage to imagine. Why? You know why most people don't imagine? Because they're afraid of failure. When you were a kid, you had a great imagination. Children have a massive amount of imagination. But the older you get, the more your imagination grows rusty. And you stop imagining what things could be and you just start living the way they are. And you get stuck in the status quo, which is Latin for the mess we're in. And you don't imagine what they could be, you just imagine, or you just think about what it is. And you stop using that imagination muscle in your life. Doubt is the enemy of imagination. And that's why it takes courage. And by the way, what is courage? Courage is doing the thing you fear the most. If you're not afraid, you don't need courage. 
You don't need courage. Courage only happens when you're scared to death. Courage is when you're scared to death, but you say, I'm gonna do it anyway. In the history of Saddleback Church, every great thing that we did, I was scared to death to do. Scared to death to do. I just said, we're gonna do it anyway. Why? Because I'm not gonna about to let fear dominate my life. So I do it, moving ahead, trembling, moving ahead in fear, and I just do it anyway. And God shows up. And God, show, and God will show up in your life. Courage is when you do the thing while you're afraid. You do the right thing. You say, well, should I wait till all the fear is gone? It's never going to go away. You just do it while you're afraid, and then it goes away. Doubt is the enemy of imagination. You have to move against your fears, and sometimes you have to ignore all the insecurities you're feeling. You say, I'm going to do it. I'm just gonna go for it. I'm gonna do it even though I'm scared to death and I'm insecure and I might fail and blah, 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 blah. James chapter one. If you need wisdom, you wanna know God's dream, vision for your life? If you need wisdom, just ask God for it because he's generous and he enjoys giving it to everyone. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. For a doubtful mind is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that's driven back and forth and tossed about by the wind. Such doubters cannot decide anything that they do, so they should not imagine, there's that word, they should not imagine receiving anything from the Lord. You gotta believe and you gotta banish doubt. You know what you need to do? You need to doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. The problem we have today is we do the exact opposite. We believe our doubts and we doubt our beliefs. No, no, doubts are meant to be doubted, beliefs are meant to be believed. So you believe your beliefs and you doubt your doubts. Your imagination in your life is either gonna be governed by fear or it's gonna be governed by faith, and that's your choice. Now, if you let your imagination be governed by fear, you're gonna go around freaked out, stressed out, worried all the time. And you're gonna worry about what other people think and you're gonna worry about are you gonna have enough and you're gonna worry about this and this and that. And, and when you allow fear to control your imagination, you live a miserable life. And instead, if you say, I'm not gonna allow fear to dominate me, I'm gonna allow faith to dominate me. And I'm gonna trust in God, all things are possible with God. Then your imagination talks about what could happen, the good things that might happen and your imagination moves you ahead. Doubt will destroy you. Now, there's a great story in the Bible about a man who had a, had a son who was sick, and he comes to, comes to Jesus, and we pick up the story in Mark chapter nine, and the man says to Jesus, please heal my son if you can. And Jesus replied, what do you mean, if I can? <laughs> Anything is possible if a person believes, the father replied, I do believe, but help me not to doubt. Now, I love this passage because I love the authenticity. I love the honesty of this guy. He goes, I believe. I just got some doubts. In one of the passages uh, uh, in uh, translations, he says, Lord, I do believe. Help me with my unbelief. And do you know what Jesus' response was to this guy when he said, what do you mean if? All things are possible if, if you believe. And, and the guy says, well, I do believe, help me with my doubts. You know what Jesus said? He says, good enough. And he heals the guy right there, on the spot, on the spot. You know, I wish I had learned a long time ago, I wish somebody told me that I don't have to have all my doubts resolved and all my questions answered in order to follow Jesus Christ and enjoy all the benefits of it. I've been walking with Jesus Christ now for almost, well, over 50 years. I still have questions. I got a list of them. I still have doubts. When I get to heaven, I'm, I'm gonna be, in, you can get in line behind me. I've got all my questions to ask Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, why did you do this? Why did you do that? I doubted this, I doubted this. I didn't think this was a good thing you did here. And on and on and on. And I'm just gonna go through my laundry list of questions and doubts. Why? Because I believe I just have some doubts. Now, if I had thought that I had to answer all my doubts and all my questions, I still wouldn't even be a Christian. What I learned, listen very closely, is I don't have to understand something for me to benefit from it. I don't have to have it all figured out for me to benefit from it. For instance, I don't understand how internal combustion works. It doesn't stop me from driving a car. 
I don't understand the chemistry of digestion. It doesn't stop me from eating a steak. <laughs> I don't understand how there are literally colored pictures flying through the air right now and going through my body and yours, but it doesn't stop me from turning on a TV and watching them. How in the world does that happen? I don't know. How can I pick out my phone and talk to somebody on the other side of the world? I don't, I don't know all of I can't explain that to you. But I don't have to explain it to enjoy it. Does that make sense? And I don't have to have all my doubts answered, all my questions resolved in order to live by faith. Lord, I believe, help me with my doubts, God says, that's good enough. And so doubt will destroy you if you let it keep you from imagining and being all that God wants you to be. So this guy comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, I want to believe, help me with my doubts. Have you ever cried out to God that way? Have you ever cried out to God and said, Lord, I want to believe, help me with my doubts? You need to do that this morning if you haven't. Now one of the things that happens because of doubt and because of fear and because of worry is vision begins to dissipate in your life. You get a dream but you leak and your dream dissipates. You, a lot of people start off in life with a great dream, a great goal, a great vision, a great objective, a great cause and a purpose to live their life for. But over time, it begins to dissipate and drain out and leak out of their life. Just much like you buy a, a balloon with helium in it, you put it up in your house, and three days later, nobody's actually poked it. It didn't all leak out at once. It just started to leak out a little bit at a time, and pretty soon it's droopy. And some of you have a flat tire emotionally. And you got a flat tire mentally because you don't, you're not dreaming anymore. You're not believing anymore. And so what you have to do is you have to re-energize the dream periodically. You have to refuel the dream or you run out of gas. How do you refuel God's dream for your life? Number six, God's spirit and God's word fuel my imagination. God's spirit and God's word fuel my imagination. These are the two sources that God provides to energize your dream so you don't run out of gas. First, he gives you his own spirit, the Holy Spirit, and second, he gives you his word and the promises of the Bible. Let me show you a couple verses. John chapter 14, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. And that helper is the spirit of truth. That's God's Holy Spirit. And you'll know him because he lives with you and he will be in you. And that's where the power comes from. It's not self-help psychology. It's not build yourself up with positive mental attitude. This is the Holy Spirit working in you, gives you power you don't have. And the other source for refueling is God's word. Psalm 119 says this. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your law. Help me to understand the meaning of your commandments and I will meditate, that's imagine, think about, consider. I will meditate on your wonderful miracles. Now, how do you do this? You need to do it on a daily basis where you listen to God as you read his word and you talk to God in prayer. And this is the key to maintaining a vision and dream for your entire life. Write this down. The key to a stronger, healthier imagination is a daily quiet time. A daily quiet time when the Holy Spirit and you and the Bible get alone and you listen to God and you talk to God and you pray and you think and you consider. And that energizes your vision. If you're not having a daily quiet time, it's no wonder your dream leaks. You gotta be in the word and you've gotta be in the spirit. And when you do that, you get alone with God, that will energize you. You need to develop that habit to maintain your dream for life every day. By the way, let me give you a couple tips on getting God's dream while we're talking about this. One of them is it's actually easier to hear from God when you're relaxed than when you're stressed out. When I'm stressed out, and my mind is going with all these fears and worries and stress and it's buzzing. I can't hear God because my mind is talking too loud to me. I've got to get relaxed. That's why we call it a quiet time. You get quiet. You get calm. You can't hear God with the radio on. You can't hear God when you're talking to yourself with all your worries. 
You get quiet, you get relaxed. And by the way, one of the things you can do, I do this all the time. I don't do it every night, but almost every night, as I'm going to sleep, the last thing I do when I put my head down is I ask God a question. And I ask him for guidance. And I say, Lord, I'm gonna be relaxed and you'll be able to talk to me a whole lot better than any other way. So sometimes I'll say, what's next? What do you want me to do next? And I put my head down on the pillow. Or I'll give him a problem and say, what do you want me to say to these people? And I'll put my head down on the, and, and go to sleep. I'll ask God a question. While I'm sleeping, the Holy Spirit has an opportunity to influence my subconscious. And many times, not every time, but many times I'll wake up with the solution to a problem I've been working on for weeks and consciously couldn't figure it out. But when I ask God to illuminate my imagination while I'm sleeping, then I'm more relaxed, I'm more receptive. This, the Bible talks about this. Look at this verse on the screen. Job 33, God speaks. God speaks again and again, though people often don't recognize it. He speaks in dreams, and he speaks in visions of the night when deep sleep falls upon people as they lie in bed. Because then you don't have all your pretensions up. You don't have all your guard up. When you're relaxed, God can communicate to you a whole lot better. And you wake up in the morning, and you got the answer. Let me show you another verse. The Bible says this, Isaiah 50. The sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom, so I know what to say to all these weary ones. God has given me this verse many times. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. Because I've started the evening going to sleep talking to the Lord, and the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I talk to the Lord again, and then I have a quiet time, and he wakens me and opens me to understanding his will. That's how he refuels your imagination. Number seven, seventh thing I've learned is that growing my character will clarify my vision. Growing my character will clarify, clarify my vision. What I mean by that is if you're having a hard time getting God's dream for your life, you just can't see it, I don't get it. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get the vision, I don't get the dream. I just don't see it, it's pretty muddy, it's, it's pretty unclear. Then what you need to do is you need to focus on growing up spiritually. Because the more mature you become, the clearer the vision will be. And as you add character qualities in your life, you're gonna be able to see things more and more clearly. That's what the Bible talks about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses five to nine. It says this, to your, to your faith add goodness. Now, we're in this series on daring faith, and the foundation of your life is faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. But he says, in addition to your faith, I want you to add some other virtues. I want you to add some other character qualities. In addition to your faith, he said, add goodness. You know, doing good things. And to your goodness, I want you to add knowledge. I want you to learn. And to your knowledge, I want you to add self-control. And to your self-control, add patience. He's talking about virtues or character qualities. He said, if you'll build these things into your life, you're gonna grow up spiritually. If you add knowledge and patience and self-control and, and, and goodness in your life, these are fruit of the Spirit. He said, you're going to become more mature. And he said, and add to your patience, add service to God. Get involved in service. Figure out a place to serve God by serving others. Get involved in a ministry. So he says, add service for God. And that's, you can't grow without doing that. And he said, and to your service for God, add kindness to your brothers and sisters in Christ. He said, practice loving other people in the church, in the family. Show kindness to other Christians. And he said, and, and to this kindness, add love for everyone. Now, all these qualities, he says, if all these things are in you and are growing, they will help you to be useful and productive. Circle the phrase, useful and productive. That is my goal for you. As your pastor, as somebody who's responsible for your spiritual growth, my goal for you is that you will be more productive and you will be more useful in life. This next year and for the rest of your life. That's why we're doing this series. I want you to be more productive and I want you to be more useful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But, he says, anyone who does not have these qualities, these things, these characteristics, cannot see 
clearly. The reason you can't see God's vision is you just need to grow up. You need to get in a Bible study. And by the way, uh, the stuff that I'm teaching you, because I can't finish it all, I put some of it in this week's small group material. This week's study, session, the, the session this week is called Stretching My Imagination. And so you're gonna be studying additional material on this in your small group. That's why you must be in a small group. You're gonna miss the second half of the message. Uh, it's called Stretching My Imagination. If you're not in a small group, it's not too late to go out and say, I'd like one of these and one of these, the DVD and the study guide. Get a couple friends and start a small group and, and go through this material. It's not too late. Finally, number eight. The eighth thing I've learned about uh, vision and dreams and imagination. If a dream is from God, if a dream is truly from God, it will be connected somehow to his church and his plan for the world. If a dream is truly from God, it will somehow be connected to his church and his plan for the world. Why would God give you a self-centered dream unconnected to what he wants to do in the world? He wants to use you for his dream. He wants to use you for his plan. And what is God's big overarching plan? God is building a family. And he's collecting family members from all, every nation, every tribe, every language, every people group. And when everybody's in the family that he knows is gonna be in the family, boom, it's over. We're going into phase two, which is eternity. That's God's big plan. God did not create you to live on earth and to live a, a self-centered life where you get up, go to work, come home, watch TV and go to bed, make a little money, retire and die. Really? You think that's all God put you here for? No, he put you here to be a part of his plan. And if he gives you a dream, you get a dream from God, it's gonna somehow impact his church and his plan for the whole world because that's what he's doing. Right before Jesus went back to heaven, you know, after the resurrection, we celebrated that last uh, last week at Easter. After he rose again, he stayed around Jerusalem for another 40 days, walking around, talking to people, having dinner with people, meeting with people. One time he spoke to 500 people at one time. And, uh, and, and so he was there for 40 days. And then after 40 days, he takes the 12 and he says, I told you that I was gonna come back to life. And he said, I'm telling you this, if I came back to life, I'm gonna come back again. And before he leaves, which is called the Ascension, he gives his great dream. He gives them a great vision, a great dream. It's called the Great Commission. And it goes like this. Go ye therefore and make disciples in every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to do everything I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That's called the Great Commission. It's the last words of Jesus before he goes back to heaven. Saddleback Church was started because of the Great Commission. Because there are people who did not know Jesus Christ, so we keep starting churches. The whole reason this church started, every church started, because of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is your commission. Jesus said this to his disciples. Watch this on the screen from the AD series that's gonna be playing tonight. It was prophesied that I would suffer and rise from the dead after three days. Believe, Peter, and the power of the Holy Spirit will come to you. When? Go back to Jerusalem and wait. Only then will you be ready to spread the word. Do this for me, Peter. And one day you will die for me. Are you ready to do that?
witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation I love this line of Pilate where he's saying, this will all soon be over. Nobody could have been more wrong than Pilate. <laughs> it wasn't soon over, it was just getting started. And we've had 2,000 years of God building his family so that now there are 2.3 billion people in it. It was not soon over. It is the largest thing on the planet. The church is bigger than anything else on this planet. Let's put this in perspective. There are 2.3 billion Christians. That means the church is bigger than China. The church is bigger than India. The church is bigger than China and India together. It is the biggest thing on the planet. Why? It's because God created it. And it's the whole purpose of history. And if God is going to have a dream for your life, a specific dream, it is somehow going to play a role and be connected to his overarching plan, the growth of his church, the growth of his kingdom, the building of his family, until one day it's completed and we're all going to heaven. Because that's what it's all about. History is his story. You weren't put here on the earth to live for yourself. Look at this last verse. Jesus says this. If you try, this is Jesus talking, if you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, that's the Great Commission, you will find true life. You know, this is what God wants to do in your life. Let me give you some questions to get started. I want you to write these down. I want to start you on a journey of finding God's dream for your life. You may have missed it for years and years and years. Don't worry about that. God's not in a hurry. He's got you exactly where he wants you to be. He brought you here today. You're listening to this message right now because God wanted you at this point to hear this. Here are three questions you can ask yourself to begin considering what is God's dream for my life. The three questions are, what if, why not, and why not me? What if, why not, and why not me? First you ask the question, what if, and you be open to new possibilities. What if I did this? What if I did that? Open the new possibilities. And then, why not? Why, what do you see in the world that needs to be done? Why is this not being done? are not being done well, are not being done enough of. You see a problem in the world that maybe you could make a difference with. Why not, why not? Why isn't this being done? And then the third question, why not me? Why not now? I use these three questions to create the peace plan. What if, why not, and why not me? You see, the reason, you know, people say, why do we have all these problems in the world, like poverty, disease, illiteracy, you know, uh, corruption, things like that in the world, these big problems. I'll tell you why. 
is because God is waiting for his children, that's you and me, to imagine the solutions. God is waiting for his children to imagine the solutions to the problems in the world. And maybe God wants to use you in a way you've never, ever even thought. To use you to make a significant difference in the world, in some part of the world. And the most important thing to remember is this. Jesus said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. God is looking for people who are tired of small thinking, petty living, weak-willed goals, self-centered dreams. I told you I was gonna push you during this Daring Faith series. Because you were made for far more than just a suburban life. You were made for more than just to be a soccer mom or a soccer dad. You were made for far more than that. God's dream, God's vision, God's goal for your life is so big you cannot even imagine it. God is looking for people who will step up, move out, and go, okay, I'm all in. I don't even know what that means. It scares me spitless, but I'm all in. And I'm gonna be a part of God's plan and God's goal for my life. You can be better. You were made for more than you're living right now. I, I know you were made for more than you're living right now. And I'm not going to let you just do that. Because I love you too much to not challenge you. And tell you that God's dream for your life is so massive. I am exhibit A of this. I grew up in a town of less than 500 people. I would have never told you that I would pastor a church 100 times bigger than the town I grew up in. But God will use you if you will just say yes. And he'll use that imagination. And great lives are built on great dreams. Let's bow our heads. I'm gonna pray a prayer that could change your life. You can pray this in your mind, in your heart. Just say, dear God, I haven't been using my imagination correctly. I've imagined things that I shouldn't have. Worry and fear and some ugly things that just aren't good. But I want to use my imagination to dream the life to be shaped by you, not by other people. Not by what my parents told me, not by what society has told me. I want my life to be shaped by your dream. I want to live by faith. I want a great life built on a great dream. And I thank you, Lord, that your dream for my life is bigger than my dream. And like that man who came to you with the sick son, I'm saying to you today, God, I believe, help me with my doubts. I believe, help me with my doubts. I wanna begin a daily time with you of reading some of the Bible and praying, talking, a quiet time where your spirit and your word refuel my imagination. I wanna grow my character I want to add to my faith so the vision gets clearer and clearer and clearer. And I want to be a part of what you're doing in the world. I want to attach my life to the greatest cause, the great commission. Your goal of gathering a family that will be with you for eternity. And I want 
what I do in some way to play a role in building your family, your church, your kingdom, and your plan for the world. So as much as I know how, I'm saying yes to you today. If you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life, just say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Make yourself real to me. I want to learn to trust you and love you. Father, I pray that you will raise up a generation of people who dream great dreams. You've said in your word that, that in the last days, old men will dream dreams and young men will, will have visions and that God, you will use people of every age and every stage and every race and every language. Forgive us for petty thinking, self-centered living, small goals. Help us to trust you. Help us to remember that when we call on Jesus, nothing is impossible. And I pray you would start a movement in our church that all the forces of hell couldn't stop in this daring faith campaign. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.